Okay, to all those of you who are joining, thank you very much for joining this uh, second in our series of Isolation Insight events uh, brought to you by UK and Changing Europe and the wonders of modern technology. Uh, today we're going to be talking about populism and the pandemic. Uh, when I put those two keywords into Google, as I want to do, it produced 2,000, no, sorry, 2 million 570,000 results. Uh, I carefully combed through each and every one of those uh, to uh, discover that there were essentially three basic responses. Uh, the first response was that uh, populists and populism will benefit from the pandemic. The second response was that actually the pandemic would end up doing for populism and uh, the populists. And the third response was, well, it's actually all a bit more complicated than that. Now, as an academic, uh, I'm always inclined to the uh, third explanation, uh, complexity, um, but maybe that's just me. So I'm hoping to gain a little bit more certainty and certainly a lot more insight uh, with the help of three of my favourite fellow academics, uh, all of whom happen to be uh, absolute experts on populism. Before I introduce them, however, I just thought I'd say a little bit about what we're talking about here. I'm going to define populism as an ideology which essentially uh, pits the uh, people uh, against a corrupt elite. Uh, now, that uh, definition of populism means that it can be applied either to the left uh, or to the right, although it has to be said that it tends in academia and indeed the media to be applied more to uh, the right wing than it does to the left wing and it's very often associated uh, with uh, nativism, with uh, xenophobia uh, and nationalism. Uh, but we can go on to talk a little bit more about you know how we define things uh, as well as uh, the consequences of the pandemic for populism uh, as we begin uh, to talk a little bit more. Uh, first up though I'm going to introduce uh, each of uh, our panel. Uh, we're going to hear first of all from uh, Matt Goodwin, who many of you uh, I'm sure will uh, be familiar with. He is Professor of Politics at the University uh, of Kent, and he is also the author of a book from Penguin uh, that's uh, out now and uh, is doing very well, National Populism. And then we're going to be hearing from uh, Catherine Fieschi, uh, who heads up the Global Policy Institute at my very own Queen Mary University of London. And she is the author of the book, and I'm going to mispronounce the first word I know, Populocracy, uh, The Tyranny of Authenticity and the Rise of Populism. And uh, then we have Paul Taggart, a former colleague of mine at the University of Sussex, 
Paul has an unerring uh, knack for spotting things that uh, academics are going to be talking about uh, in the future. Um, the most obvious of these perhaps is uh, Euroscepticism, uh, which Paul has published on uh, extensively. But uh, he also published back in 2000, so 20 years ago, Paul, not that I want to make you feel old, uh, uh, a book simply entitled Populism. He's also the author of a uh, big book uh, on the subject, an editor of the big book on the subject, the Oxford Handbook of Populism, uh, which is basically everything you always wanted to know about populism, but were too afraid to ask. But as those of you who know UK and Changing Europe uh, well know, we're not too afraid to ask anything. So I'm going to start off by asking Matt Goodwin uh, to talk for you know around five minutes uh, about his view on this particular topic. Matt, take it away. Thanks, Tim, and good morning uh, to everybody who's joined the call. And um, thanks as well to um, Paul and Catherine um, uh, for for, for the conversation. Um, so, in a way, I wanted to uh, start um, by thinking about this crisis by going back to the last crisis. And I suppose of the three views that Tim laid out at the start, I would say that yeah, it's a lot more complicated than populism is going to to lose or populism is going to be the big winner. Um, it's a bit like trying to make sense of the impact of the Great Recession in the aftermath of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. At that point, we, we really wouldn't have seen all that was going to follow over the next decade. And, and that decade, as we now know, really became a decade of heightened political volatility, uh, fragmentation and the consolidation of national populism. It was a decade that saw Brexit uh, the decade that saw Trump, the decade that saw the breakthrough of various populist parties in Europe and, and further afield. And as Roger, Ine Roger Ewell and I argued, it was a decade that really saw the sharpening of many of the underlying divides that had been coming before the Great Recession, uh, I think were then exacerbated by that crisis. And, and there are good reasons now to expect those to be uh, further widened by the Great Lockdown. Um, but I'm actually going to argue um, today, just as a thought experiment, um, I just want to push back against the idea that, that what we're going through now is going to be uh, a, a big breakthrough uh, moment for populism. And there have been a few studies already that have been pointing to, to that outcome. And I just wanted to outline, as, again, as a thought experiment, four points as to why I, I don't think that populism will end up being the big winner. The first relates to the hierarchy of needs uh, and Abraham Maslow's famous um, uh, dissection of, our, of, the, of the motivations that drive humans that has informed much of our work on value change. And we know that in general, it's economic prosperity and affluence that has allowed human beings to focus on those higher level needs of esteem, social status and recognition. But actually what this crisis is doing is pushing us back down the hierarchy of needs to those basic concerns over economic uh, security, but more, more essentially physical uh, security. What's different from the great, um, what's different between the great lockdown and the great recession, um, I think is that the great recession was a double crisis that was political and economic. The great lockdown is a triple crisis that focuses on politics, economics and health. And we know that different groups are going to have very different experiences. We know that the insulated and the sheltered professional middle classes will have a fundamentally different experience from this crisis than left behind workers. We know that in the short term, social isolation is compulsory, but in the longer term, it will be voluntary and it will become an economic luxury. Um, but I don't think that those workers will inevit inevitably or necessarily turn to populism, because if we're going to see anything, I think it's going to be the return of those big economic questions over redistribution, taxation, inequality and wealth, who pays for what, um, rather than uh, those identity culture questions that have dominated for much of the past decade. My second key point um, really relates to um, something that Tim has already mentioned, which is the uh, anti-establishment nature of populism. If we go back to the last crisis, uh, that crisis was top down. It started in the liquidity markets and, and, and then hit workers a little bit later on. Whereas this crisis is very much bottom up. It's, it's as we now know from research in the UK and the US, 
it's hitting low skilled service sector workers, gig economy workers, low educated workers much harder than it is hitting the professional middle classes. And that will, that will accelerate, I, I would argue, as we go into exit strategies and start to come out of lockdown. But you know, what's interesting for me at least is that it, it's much easier to blame the financial markets and politicians as the populists did when they were seen to be in cahoots than it is to blame the state when it is the state that is coming to the rescue on not one, but two different occasions, right? For current generations of voters, they will have seen the state not only come to the rescue during the Great Recession, but more importantly, they are now having a direct experience of the state coming to the rescue, paying their wages, keeping them going during a much more fundamental essential uh, crisis. Fiscal conservatism and economic liberalism were two of the earliest victims of this crisis. And so I think that if anyone is going to get the blame, it won't necessarily be establishment politicians per se, but I think actually it may be other actors in society. I can think of the wealthy, for example, coming under much greater scrutiny as people go through these very different experiences of the crisis. If you think, for example, about the Richard Branson debate in the UK, if you think about Denmark, France and Poland and how they've handled state aid for offshore businesses, if you think about the discussion in the US about so-called quarantinis and the wealthy um, moving out to their second homes, if this is going to exacerbate these social divides, it may exacerbate them in a way that actually benefits movements on the left. And one hypothesis that's kind of hanging over this crisis, is this what social democracy needs to get back in the game? Is this crisis actually going to create more room for social democrats to now, you know, uh, re-establish their relationship with with voters, an ideology that's been in crisis since the mid two thousands? Will it further entrench and help green movements that have been, you know, green on the outside but but red on the inside? And will it push these questions of economic reform to the forefront? And lastly, um, immigration. Uh, James Dennison and Andrew Geddes have, have written a very interesting piece in the last few days um, about how the salience of migration has fallen, uh, not just in the UK, where since the vote for Brexit, we've seen immigration fall out of the top 10 issues. But actually across Europe, we've not only seen the salience of immigration fall, but we've seen attitudes become more positive. That, to me, suggests that that kind of demand side um, element that's crucial for populism is, is, is now going to become quite, uh, uh, become a lot more challenging for these parties. But also added to that, one of the narratives that we've seen emerge, particularly in the UK, is the critical importance of migrant workers for navigating this crisis. And the national discussion has moved away from migrants as a threat to migrants as an ethnic minorities, established citizens, as contributing to public services and to the national community and valuing that contribution in a much bigger way. And we won't know for a long time. I'd love to have a natural experiment in, you know, in the field right now, but what is the experience of a population coming out every week to celebrate and um, recognize the contribution of key workers, many of whom are ethnic minority, migrant backgrounds, will that lead to a substantial change in attitudes that will undercut populism perhaps? The only point it gets against that, Tim, which is my last point, is the one thing we are seeing in surveys across uh, Australia, India, US and UK and Europe is a hardening of anti-China attitudes. There is another kind of hypothesis that's hanging in the air, which is will this crisis lead to a much greater politicization of China, which until now has been a trading economic challenge in the public mindset, but now may become what we've not really seen since the Cold War, which is a systemic threat. And will that uh, heightened perception of China as a broader threat, not just to economic markets, but to ways of life and values, will that actually give populists what they've not really had since the Cold War, which is a much broader external threat to the national community? So there's not, you know, I'm not, it's not one or the other. I think that inevitably this is going to be complicated with lots of different points coming into, coming into the debate. Um, but that's just to get us going in, with the discussion. So thanks for now. That's great. Thank you very much, Matt. That's uh, a great deal of food for thought already. Uh, Catherine, I'll hand over to you.
Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for kicking us off, Matt. Um, I suppose that um, one of the questions we need to ask is, is what do we mean? What do we mean by the pandemic? Do we just mean the health crisis? Um, you know, and how do we think about um, the consequences of this health crisis when um, the, the health crisis mutates uh, potentially into an economic crisis and then potentially into a, a social crisis? So I think that the first thing that's, that's obvious is that um, those populist uh, parties, particularly in opposition, and I will go, go back to that uh, in a minute, um, that tried to kind of make hay uh, around the health crisis, pointing to, to you know, the failures of keeping, uh, keeping the borders shut, uh, the failures of globalization, et cetera, et cetera. Those parties, whether it be, you know, Salvini initially or, or Marine Le Pen in, 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 in France, they didn't do particularly well by being strident on this. Um, they actually lost, uh, not a lot, but, you know, lost three, four, five points uh, and, and, and so on, as in a sense, there was a rally uh, around, um, around, the, the, uh, around the governments and the, and, the heads of, and the heads of state. That didn't last uh, terribly long. Um, it's very interesting that um, even in places, for example, like, like Italy, where, uh, where Conte all of a sudden, you know, saw his popularity and his legitimacy, you know, rise to uh, unprecedented uh, levels. Um, once the, first of all, the gravity of the health crisis um, came, dawned uh, on, on Italian citizens. Um, and once, of course, governments everywhere, but including the, the Italian government, started to struggle uh, with the pandemic, as, as any government, uh, any public sector would, um, that you know the, the there was an erosion of, of of popularity, but much more to the point, which I think is you know uh, is probably going to be a, a, an example that we're going to see repeated uh, repeated elsewhere. Once the conversation started to shift uh, toward you know the role of Europe, the role of European institutions, whether or not there was any solidarity with Italy, whether there were echoes uh, of mistreatment uh, or or disdain toward uh, toward Italy. Once that started to become more more prevalent, then you could see you know actually you know a, a, a kind of a, a rise in support for populists and an erosion to some extent of Conte. We're, we're still at a time where, and I would agree with, we really would agree with, with Matt on this, which is that, you know, to, to some extent, um, I don't think that this is going to be a massive uh, shakeup in favor of, of populists uh, at, at, this, at this point. Uh, but I would say that whereas health crisis won't benefit uh, populists in opposition. Um, you know, uh, certainly, you know, an economic crisis and a social crisis can actually, uh, you know, um, again, worsen those divides that we've talked about uh, before and which, and which Matt mentioned. So there is this notion here, I think, which is important, which is that um, to some extent, I feel that, you know, we grant this virus, you know, powers that it doesn't have and, and, and you know, and to some extent, it sort of gives us amnesia. Um, one of the things that, you know, we're going to see is that this may not be, at least not immediately, you know, this massive ideological reset, you know, there's going to be a sense in which we're going to pick up where we, where we left off to some extent and where we left off in Europe, and I think this is important, is, you know, a sense of, you know, across European countries, you know, strife, strikes, uh, polarization, um, you know, and, it, and in a sense, a, a very vol a set of very volatile, um, very volatile contexts. I think that it's worth talking about um, whether the populists are incumbents or in opposition. This is this. It seems to me is is extremely important because, to some extent, I know this is a slightly uh, slapdash characterization, but you could argue that you know you've got populists in, in power in the in the UK, populist light potentially, uh, you know, and a populist in power uh, in, in the US. And I think that this is one of the things about this crisis that we, you know, that we shouldn't miss, if you like, this pandemic that we shouldn't miss, which is that um, 
it allow it, it's a symmetric shock uh you know however asymmetric the consequences and it allows us to see things about uh populism that perhaps weren't quite so obvious before and one of the things that is really uh obvious is that um first of all for for the for the populists in power what you have is a situation which is both irresistible to them but also highly dangerous it's completely irresistible because a crisis is a spotlight and you know in the case of Boris Johnson in the case of Trump they're not only populists they're raging narcissists right and so to some extent they're going to be um, they're going to be drawn to the spotlight they're going to be drawn to the stage which is a which is an incredibly um, dangerous uh, thing a dangerous thing to do so I would argue that you know combination of personality and being the incumbent in this case isn't necessarily going to do you any good. Um, I was I was looking at, you know, the 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 polls around Trump. And I think it's it's interesting that that, you know, we do see that, you know, he has taken uh, he has taken a knock and also he's taken a knock um, in some of the really crucial constituencies, particularly with older people. You know, this is the, the, the coronavirus crisis doesn't do somebody who's, you know, quite reliant on older voters uh, uh, any good. So I think we need to, to uh, you know, to make that distinction. That, um, you know, that is important. So where you're in, where you're an incumbent, populist or not, this is not very good for you because no matter how well you're handling the crisis, and I would argue, I would even make this argument with respect to, to Germany. The fact is that you're going to end up being an incumbent with, you know, huge levels of debt. You could always argue that it could have been worse, but the fact is that it's really very hard to win elections or, or maintain stability on these counterfactuals. If you're in opposition, I don't think it's going to do you any harm. And I think it's probably as a populist. And I think, um, and I think that, that, you know, we should see that it, it might, in fact, uh, help uh, help a little. I just want to conclude on on two, um, you know, or rather one one quick point, which is about really um, the the looking ahead bit. Um, uh, and we're going to we ask ourselves, you know, is uh, is is populism, you know, going to do well out of this, or is it not going to do well out of this? I think to some extent, what we're going to see, and which matters more, is. Um, is uh, I agree potentially, you know, um, a return of a of a much more powerful state, and you know, and and I I would like, you know, I I hope that as Matthew said, you know, this could be an opportunity for social democracy. On the other hand, you know, I would argue that you know an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of um, reliance and hopes are going to be placed on governments who will have spent an awful lot of money, who will be highly indebted. Um, and I, I question their possibility of being able uh, to act as decisively or with the room for maneuver that many citizens would expect. And I think that to some extent, it's the potential for that disappointment, not just to keep, you know, uh, pouring, uh, to pour more money in, but actually also to deliver on some of the deep system change that I don't think people will have forgotten about. I think, you know, there will be still be demands placed on government, for example, around, uh, around climate. There may be new generational demands um, as well. Whether any of the, the governments that, um, that we're talking about in, 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 uh, in democracies, in developed democracies in particular, will be able to actually deliver on this is a, is a huge question for me. And if they don't, and if polarization rises, um, and inequality in particular becomes uh, more apparent, then, you know, I wonder whether this doesn't actually, not necessarily in the short term, but in the medium term, actually benefit uh, various populist options that may look slightly different from the ones that we have now. Thank you very much, Catherine. That's great. Uh, Paul, on to you. Thanks, Tim, and thanks to those of you uh, watching and listening. I appreciate you being here and, and really thoughtful comments from both Matt and Catherine. I'm slightly alarmed at, at how Catherine managed to see my notes. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to say a couple of very similar things about government and opposition. I think that's important to make. Um, so some of the things I have to say will reinforce that. Let me just start, go back a bit. I mean, what's the effect of, of the pandemic on populism? Well, 
obviously, you know, to quote Zoom in Lai, it's too soon to tell. Um, we don't know yet. We're, we're just coming out the top of the curve. So this is, this is an ongoing process. So let me just start with saying one thing, which is that I think, we've, you know, let's look back. What, 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 is, what is populism at the moment? And what, what do we know about it? Um, I mean, the one thing I would want to emphasize is that populism is quite plural. There are lots of different populisms in, in Europe and across the world. And Tim, you pointed to the difference between left and right, but even on the right, there are different emphases and there are different, uh, different agendas. There's different success rates. And as Catherine's pointed out, some are in power and some are not. So I think it's very dangerous that we see populism as a blob. It's not a blob. It's, uh, it's quite differentiated um, as an experience. And, and that's all that has been the case even before the pandemic. And the other thing I'd say about populism is, is it's not, to me, the key thing is that um, it's obviously about anti-establishment, speaking the name of the people, but it's also a particular view of politics and a certain distaste of politics. Um, Catherine in her book talks about the rise of authenticity. That's it's trying to reclaim a different form of politics. Okay, so there's something more than just being anti-establishment and pro-people because that that's that's fascist, that's communist. You know, all that, lots of people can fit under that category. There's something about populism how it dislikes politics, as, as far as I'm concerned. Now, I, di I differ from Catherine. I don't I don't see the, the current British government as a, as a populist force. I don't even see Brexit as a, as a populist phenomenon. I think there are populist elements there, but I think you should be more limited about how we use it. But okay, so the, the second thing I'd say is, is the, the same thing that, the, that Catherine was saying. We're talking about the pandemic. We're talking about, I think, two crises. We're talking about the health crisis. And I would say we're talking about the economic crisis. And if you just unpack a little bit, what we might expect on those two aspects, I think that's what we can usually do. In terms of the health crisis, how would, how should populists, how would we expect them to react to it? Well, the health crisis across the world has done some things that are really, um, shot the fox for um, populism. It's, it, first of all, it privileges expertise. Expertise is back on the table. We, we, we want to hear what the doctors, the, the, um, the experts say about that health. That really matters. That's important. It empowers the establishment. Um, the establishment is who we turn to. We don't suddenly say, right, oh, well, we're unhappy with you all. We, we know that the governments are going to have to do something about it. We know that those governments are more supported, that the rally around the flag effect, which we know we know from our research is a very common feature in wars and this sort of crisis. It's short lived perhaps, but it, while it's living, it's quite powerful. And, and also it actually nationalizes politics. Uh, the, the response to the, the health crisis has been a national response. It's even shown the Eurosceptic element, you know, well, actually it's shown that Free movement of people can be shut down pretty damn quickly when you when you need to do it. Nations can reassert themselves. Um, you know, if you're a Eurosceptic, you say, "Oh, I think I saw Daniel Hannan said the nation states back." Well, I don't think it ever went anywhere. But pandemic reinforces the power and the importance of the nation nation states. In a sense, that's what a lot of populists in, in different in different guises have been seeking for. It's what, what, what Matt and Roger talk about in their conception of, of national populism. So, so the health crisis actually is quite complicated. It, it, it takes away a lot of the, the, the grievances or, or it, it mutes them for a while and it empowers the, the, the populist enemies in ways that are, um, we might not expect. The only thing I would say is that you do see the rise of conspiracy theories, I think is, is a kind of populist trope. It's not something that necessarily occurs, but the, it, it, and again, that to me comes around from that, the, the populist dislike of, of politics in a way. Oh, it's got to be got to be something else going on. Can't just be the complicated, messy world of politics. But in all other respects, the health crisis is pretty bad for populists. I think there's no question of that, whether they're in power or not in power. I suppose if they're in power, they're getting a bit more rally around the, effect, uh, rally around the flag effect. The second crisis, the economic crisis, I mean, Catherine talked about an economic and social crisis. I just say, I just focus on the economic crisis and say, we don't normally know these things are coming, but we know this is coming. And the, the power of, a, of an oncoming uh, economic uh, crisis of, of various dimensions for different countries will, will be very significant. We know that is going to come. And, and that's, where, that's where Matt started, quite rightly, in a sense, right? Can we, how can we interpret the response to an economic crisis, looking at how populists respond to previous economic crises? An economic crisis will be divisive and the responses to them will be different in different European states. Uh, different across the world. So th there's probably much more purchase that the populists can get there if they want to, if they're insurgent, 
uh, figures, if they're government figures, and they'll probably be damaged by that. So, you know, I'm going back to your, your point, Tim, it, 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 the story is complicated. I mean, I think in, in I would say the, the key thing is that in the future, there will be some sort of substantial political blowback from what is going on now, both the health crisis and the economic crisis. How that met, um, carries out depends upon, upon to some extent, the, the success or, or failures of, of different states and the different agendas of different populists and the different statuses of whether they're in government or, or not. All the blowback won't be populist. There'll be a lot of non-populist blowback. Again, to go to Matt's point about social democracy, that could be that could be the blowback for in some states. Um, we need to be careful not to see populism sort of, you know, absorbing everything. So populism will will have a very differentiated, I think, response to this according to how these two effects play out and interact in the different states that, that we see them at the moment. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, we'll now um, throw it open to um, discussion and some questions uh, from me, but also um, some questions from our audience, uh, and I'll do my best to uh, address uh, some of those. Um, actually, uh, someone has asked something that I was thinking of uh, asking uh, Matt about anyway, which was, I, I think you make a very good point when you say that the image in some ways of migrants may have shifted. Uh, during this pandemic um, from one of, if you like, parasites, as far as some people who are opposed to migration see them, uh, to one of um, heroes uh, for many people, particularly with regard to their role as key workers and particularly with regard to their role in the NHS. However, uh, as one of our audiences um, pointed out, uh, come the economic crisis that will surely follow uh, the, the pandemic, uh, may it not be the case that that shifts once again as these people um, who you know have recently entered the country uh, are seen as competing for very very scarce jobs and will that in fact not be something that plays to uh, the advantage of populists and I'm not just talking about the UK here obviously but also about other countries in Europe. Matt what do you think? I think it's uh, entirely Possible in some ways, that's what we saw play out uh, over the previous decade. It was the it was the sort of potent cocktail of economic insecurity you know, wrapped up with the um, refugee issue that really um, provided um, quite an opening for um, national populists in Europe. And of course, that latter issue is still not resolved. It's not resolved within the European Union. And increasingly, you can see how populists in the UK are beginning to navigate around that issue, you know, in terms of what's happening on the, the Kent coast. And, and, and it's not difficult to see how that issue comes back. But my suggestion, perhaps my hope, um, is the parameters of that conversation, I think, have now changed. You know, we are now in a world where we have a prime minister who publicly thanked nurses and doctors from other countries for saving his life, which might be an idealistic observation, but it's one that you can see, you know, you can see how that trickles into our, our public and political debate. The next time somebody ch challenges immigration, the, inev the inevitable response from all of our mainstream political parties will be, yes, but look at what just happened in this crisis. And I think the parameters of that conversation will change the social norms of that conversation, I think will be a little bit uh, more different. And of course, in the UK, this is also taking place against the backdrop of an immigration policy that is already changing. We are already beginning to move to a sort of point-based system, you know, where the incumbent government will be able to have a more meaningful response to people who say, well, you know, immigration is out of control and, you know, look at all of these people coming in, etc. I think the government, you know, the whole dynamics of that conversation um, will change. Um, but Paul and, and Catherine may have further thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, one further thought actually that I have is, of course, there's always been this tendency to distinguish between good immigrants and bad immigrants, as it were, and also between immigrants based on their ethnicity. So coming back to something that uh, you said, Matt, actually. Uh, about China, and of course you were talking about China in a kind of geopolitical sense, but we, we could well find that the uh, 
the, the attitudes of people to particular immigrants from particular countries, you know, will disadvantage some rather than others. And of course, we're already seeing uh, incidences of, you know, racism against um, you know, people of Chinese extraction in Britain and perhaps also in other countries, as far as I know, rise. Uh, whereas, you know, discrimination and, and, and racist uh, incidents, you know, against uh, immigrants from, from uh, other ethnicities, you know, seem to have, have fallen as attitudes have become uh, a little bit more uh, positive. Okay. Uh, well, I, I did also uh, have uh, a question for um, Catherine, actually. I mean, you uh, and Paul both mentioned, uh, you know, the fact that opposition and um, uh, government dynamics are very, very uh, important. And, and you, Catherine, seem to be suggesting that um, almost any government, incumbent government, which is going to be faced with this uh, economic crisis is going to find it difficult to avoid the, the, the blame for that. Um, but are, aren't populists particularly expert at blame shifting, if you like? Um, aren't they very, very good traditionally at being able to say, well, it's, it's not my fault, but it's the fault of the establishment or it's the fault of you know, migrants or it's the fault. So are, aren't populist governments, some people would say, in some senses, um, probably kind of better uh, at getting out of the bind, which I think you quite correctly identify for any incumbent government. Yeah, I mean, so I think if we um, if we look at who the incumbents might be, right, um, and you know, there's a slight question mark on whether or not current British government is populist. I have a smaller question mark over that, um, but but I, I agree that it's I agree it's not clear cut. But if you know, look at we look at Trump or we look at you know we look at Bolsonaro, uh, you know, to some extent, and we see that to you know they um, it goes back a little bit to that point about crisis, right? So that on the one hand, you're right, populists are good at blame shifting. Um, you know, they're they're not they're not as good at blame at, at blame shifting if they're in power and in a sense, you know, in this case, they are implicated up to their necks and making very obvious public decisions. I, I do think that this is one of the cases where we're not overstating, you know, the power of this crisis and the framing of this crisis. It is a very particular, um, it is a very particular moment. And I think that to some extent, it's going to be harder to you know, to 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 shift the blame. I also think that you know it goes back to this idea that you know that many of them are actually you know whether it's uh, whether it's Trump or it's Johnson or it's it's Bolsonaro, um, particularly Trump and Johnson. You know when I say they're raging narcissists, by by that I mean that you know the point of being in power is not a necessarily a deeply ideological one, but it is about, you know, it is about themselves. It is about the stage that they occupy and therefore they will grab the mic, um, you know, with rather disastrous consequences, right? I mean, utterly disastrous consequences, you know, for Trump where you have to shuffle him off the stage and tell him that, you know, really just, be quiet, but you know, not terribly good consequences uh, for for Boris Johnson either, right? I mean, you know, he's he's managed to keep his his popularity up. I think his illness, you know, helps uh, helps him in that respect. But the fact is that you know he's not coming across, and and his government isn't coming across as terribly convincing. So I do think that this this um, crisis, because of the you know the heavy involvement. Uh, of government is actually going to be one that it's, it's going to be harder for them to shift the blame off of. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Paul, a uh, question for you. You, um, like the others and like many commentators, have, have mentioned the fact that, you know, expertise is back uh, and that uh, this group uh, who populists often um, criticise uh, are possibly the people who are going to save us in, in uh, this current crisis that we face. Do you think that can be overdone, though, in the sense that clearly if the experts on whom the government are, uh, are relying don't give the right advice or the response uh, that they suggest doesn't actually pay off, um, won't that give populists uh, another chance, actually, to say, well, you know, you listen to these guys, what good did it do you? Yes, I think it will. In, in the long term, um, that's a very that's a, 
almost an inevitability. I mean, the thing about the dislike of expertise, it's a rather sort of trite statement. Actually, to be honest with you, if you look through populists in history, a lot of them quite like expertise. So it's a bit of a generalization. I'll actually flip it around and say, why do they dislike experts? Um, or if they do dislike them, well, it's actually about the, the, the wisdom of ordinary people. And that's what, what, what populism has this gut feeling that oh, we really know what we need to do. We really do know what we need to do. And I think that, that in that, in, for these kind of moments um, uh, of this pandemic, of the, of the health crisis, that's actually quite difficult to say. In other words, we don't quite know exactly when we should uh, release lockdown. We don't quite know what the R rates are. So we are very beholden upon elites at, at that level. So you're right, it, it only has a limited purchase about expertise can, can work against you, but it's more about that kind of that instinct to, to devalue politics at, at a national level. Can, can, I, can I answer something that, that Catherine said, or just build on what she said before? Always. I mean, your, your point about the, the, the difference between government, you know, um, populist and government. So obviously we think of places like, like Hungary and, 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 and Poland and, 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 um, and obviously Trump in the US. I think it, my, my sense of populism, when it gets into power, it has one of three strategies. It either um, tries to limit its populism, it kind of rolls back on its populism and it becomes more normal, more mainstream or whatever. Um, or it actually reshapes the institutions. It actually says, well, no, we need to shape things to, uh, and it changes the institutions so that it can, it, it can uh, have more effectiveness. It actually, you see that much more with Latin American populists. The third strategy is the strategy, which I would sort of call, is it the May West, and hang on for a bumpy ride, you know, and politics, you behave like the opposition when you're in, in, in government. Now, if you take those three, those three, those three um, strategies of how populists cope with being in power, and then you throw in a, in, a, in a crisis. I think it shows, for example, why Trump is having great difficulty because he's clearly, he's the third of those strategies. I'm gonna behave oppositionally. Um, and the, and the, the theoretically that the, uh, the pandemic gives you an, an opposition, it gives you, a, if you're Trump, it's a Chinese virus and so on. But actually it's very difficult to maintain that, that, that politics as a, sustained, as a sustained moment. And therefore it kind of forces others, I think more populist. If you see, I think the case of law, law and justice in, in in Poland is very interesting how they have managed to maintain their, their position in power and it's not it's not, it's a very statist form it's actually um, giving very generous welfare benefits as kind of left-wing populism uh, combined with the cultural um, right-wing populism um, so they have a very different response to being in power and again the divergent conceptions but I think putting the crises into into governments and being populist is can be very tricky Okay, thank you very much. Uh, talk of the left brings me back actually to, to Matt's point about who might benefit from this uh, and it not being um, populists, uh, but actually social uh, democrats. But um, I also wondered to some extent whether there is a kind of, you know, left populist response uh, to this. I mean, obviously, when we, we talk about populism in the media and academia, we very often associate it with right wing parties. Um, but, you know, clearly, uh, you know, there is such a thing as left wing populism and people often point to Spain or, or, or point to Italy. So I wondered, Matt, if you could, you know, just think about this and you talked about um, thought experiments. How could a, a kind of left populist strategy, either pursued by a kind of far left party or by a mainstream social democratic party, uh, work out well uh, for such a party? Well, I, I think it could be a very prosperous time for left left wing movements left wing populists for a variety of reasons catherine mentioned uh you know what to me is the it's the critical point about this crisis which is the return of the state the expansion of the state we are entering into whether we like it or not uh, an era of big government of a more interventionist government and i've seen people make the argument that if you put this into a much broader context that you could argue that you know the first big crash of the 20th century in 1929, really paved the way for a much bigger state, the New Deal in America, welfare states in Europe. You then fast forward to the 1970s, it had become clear that the state had overreached and exhausted itself and that paved the way for Thatcherism and Reaganism. You fast forward to 2008 again and, and we see the Great, the great Recession really uh, be a, uh, the end result of the market overreaching uh, and, and that combined with this crisis was really paving the way for a much bigger state. And, and the question now I think is, well, 
particularly for my students, for example, by the time they reach 25, you know, they will have seen two global financial crises and a global pandemic. And, and who has come to the rescue in both of those crises? It's been the state. And I think then you're going to have these generations of voters, firstly, that are going to be used to a much bigger government, that are going to be looking to government for the answers on climate, as Catherine said, but also on a whole array of issues around economic redistribution, which I think is going to have all kinds of interesting cohort effects. Economic liberals, the Dan Hannans, the free marketeers are going to have to make their case all over again to a generation that can't really remember what life was like, didn't know what life was like prior to, to the Great Recession. And that could, if social democrats and left populists are clever, that could be, you know, the that could open the door for their return to say, well, look, now is the time to really do all the things that we should have done a decade ago to help the groups that got battered by the last crisis and now go, are now going to get hit again by this crisis. Low income, low skilled service sector workers, less well-educated workers, you know, the Resolution Foundation today pointing out how GCSE level uh, education um, versus university uh, level education, that those two groups are going to have incredibly different experiences of these crises. And you're going to see um, uh, the percentage chance of degree holders, uh, their employment um, uh, prospects are going to drop by about uh, 6%. But for low, the, the least well-educated groups, they're going to drop by about 27 to 30 wow. percent. So you're going to see those very same groups that have been most receptive to populism and really be hit quite hard again by this crisis. And so for, for left-wing populists, you know, the, the no-brainer is to come out and say, you know, this is the moment now to use this, this uh, uh, opportunity to deal with the deep economic questions uh, that we should have dealt with a decade ago, because we've got used as political scientists to saying the left-right divide doesn't matter anymore, mm. that it's all about values, it's open versus closed. Actually, I mean, I'd never really believe that. I think it, the left-right divide may actually come back with a vengeance, and if the left is clever, it could use that to its advantage. Okay, thanks, Matt. Now, I mean, I'm going to actually move on to Catherine, um, and partly because of that. The two countries that you know very well, Italy and, and France in particular, um, obviously have uh, far left parties as well as far right parties. If you had to look at those two countries, and, you know, why don't we have a look at a couple of case studies? Uh, you already mentioned Salvini. I mean, do you see any potential there for uh, as it were, the populists on the, the left in, in French politics and maybe in Italian politics as well, and you can talk to this as well, uh, the populists on, on the right. So it's, it's really interesting because, I mean, in the case of Italy, um, we, we tend to have uh, sl slightly forgotten, but actually, you know, they, the, the, the populists on the left are actually the, the majority holders in the, in, in the government uh, at the moment. Conte is sort of, you know, independent prime minister, but really he comes out of the five star movement. Mm -hmm. um, and what he's, you know, what he's experiencing actually, I think is a good clue as to, you know, uh, what might happen on the, on the populist left. And when I say on the populist left, I mean, you know, a populist left that actually, um, you know, does, you know, does also believe in, you know, the will you know this this overriding will of the people over technocracy over you know ossified institutions and and so on and so forth so what we're seeing in italy is really interesting which is that you know the the closer conte gets to actually striking a deal uh, that enables Italy to access recovery funds, uh, you know, the stability mechanism in Europe and so on and so forth, you know, the more under stress he places his party because actually the really left-wing faction of the Five Star Movement do not want to go down this road, which they see as the road of a dictatorial technocratic Europe that doesn't have Italian um, and the, the Italian uh, people's interests at heart. So, you know, he's in a he's in a difficult position precisely because of, you know, this resurgence on the left uh, of his own party. Um, Italy has to go through a set of votes, parliamentary votes, in order to agree to actually access, uh, you know, the, the, the funds and, and, and so on. And, and these votes are not in the bag, right? Um, so you have, you know, a five-star PM, 
who actually may very well be brought down by the fact that the left wing of his own party and Salvini's uh, Lega actually really agree on this. So, you know, you here you've got the potential coalition, um, you know, of, of, these, of these interests. Um, in the case of France, um, the the uh, Marine Le Pen has actually been relatively quiet. You know, she she knows this is not her this is not her moment. Uh, on the other hand, somebody like Jean Luc Mélenchon, who is uh, you know on uh, who would be I suppose the left wing the left wing populist, has been incredibly uh, vocal in his criticism of Macron. Now the, the point is that you know in France being vocal against Macron. <laughs> It's just, you know, it's it's a rather widespread pursuit. Let's put it this way. Uh, this is somebody who's who's under fire. But you know, Ma uh, Mélenchon had actually gone down in the polls, and this crisis is actually benefiting him. It is giving him a podium, and you know, it's allowing him to argue, um, you know, that that the government is being uh, incompetent, and also particularly as France reopens and comes out of lockdown that essentially you know risks are being taken with citizen lives in order to protect a liberal economy yeah okay uh, paul uh, uh, over to you i mean it flows uh, in some ways from talk of marine le pen uh, and obviously you've written an awful lot about euroscepticism and people are talking about the you know the build up of euroscepticism within Italy. Uh, do you see the, the EU supposed, and I stress supposed, failure to kind of coordinate action uh, on the economic consequences of the pandemic uh, as uh, you know, a possible driver for increased Euroscepticism, both in Italy maybe and in other countries uh, in, in the EU 27? Yeah, well, I mean, you asked about what's the reaction of left populism, and if you look at that. Uh, Pablo Iglesias, the uh, Podemos leader and the deputy prime minister of Spain, his his answer is EU needs to be doing more. Um, so you know something that the left wing populism is going up. Um, the the larger question about the what, what does it do for 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 the the European issue as a kind of populist, insofar as it is a, sometimes used in a populist way, how does it does it reinforce your skepticism? I, I find this quite difficult to get a handle on, if I'm honest with you is you very carefully said that the supposed failure. I mean, in a sense, if you're a Eurosceptic, um, Europe has failed because it hasn't intervened or because it, it, it um, or what? I mean, in a sense, if, if the national bound, boundaries and, and nation states are taking control of this, it sort of gives the lie that, that Europe is controlling, controlling our, our lives. So actually, I'm not sure it, it, it necessarily reinforces that. On the other hand, you know, um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen apologised for the, the European Commission president, apologised for the Europe, Europe's bad treatment of Italy. There's kind of solidarity failures. Um, uh, so in a sense, the, 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 the very heart, heart you know, the, the core of the European uh, elite establishment, in, in, it was almost setting itself up, especially in that Catherine was talking about with the with the financial settlement and the difficulties it had, had for it, it's setting itself up as a target for, for, uh, for your, your sceptic hostility. But in a sense, I, I don't quite understand why Europe should be expected to deal with this, this health crisis. As a, if you, if you think, I think sort of Europe is, is a mixture of the nation state and, and, and a European integration level process, then it's horses for courses. And, and I'm, I'm not fully convinced that this, that, that, that Euroscepticism will become a huge um, weapon for the populace, but I'm, I could be wrong about that. And I, I do think that I, I'm wrong about many things, but um, uh, I, I'm aware that people are, that might be a growing uh, impetus. Uh, but I don't see it at the moment. And the other thing you have to bear in mind is this: people overstate the the, the, the power of what I would call hard Euroscepticism. Hard Euroscepticism, where you say I dislike the European project so much that I don't want my country to be a member of the European Union. In the UK, obviously, when we have that, but there's very little hard Euroscepticism out there externally. I mean, if you really look at what the Eurosceptics say, even, and maybe Catherine can correct me, even Marine Le Pen is not advocating with withdrawal. You know, she's flirted with the idea of a referendum, you know, and, but people tend to put Euroscepticism as the same thing. Criticising it is different from wanting to leave it, and I think too often um, we, we assume that all Euroscepticism is about wanting to leave the European Union, especially sitting in the country that we, we're currently sitting in. Um, but that, that's to, to miss some of the nuance there. 
Okay. Well, I mean, that takes me uh, nicely back to Matt, actually, when we're talking about hard Euroscepticism and the home of hard Euroscepticism in some senses being uh, the UK and it's led us out of the European Union. Um, uh, and that brings me to Nigel Farage. Um, we've seen him recently um, supposedly breaking, allegedly, I have to be careful what I say, breaking lockdown, uh, coming to East Sussex, I think, from Kent to talk about, you know, illegal migration, uh, etc. Do you think um, uh, a populist politician like uh, Nigel Farage in some ways struggles during this pandemic because, you know, it, it's crowded out the kind of issues that, perhaps he's used to being able to mobilise opinion on that. I think it's similar to, to Catherine's point about Le Pen in the sense that this isn't a crisis that naturally plays to, to what Farage is all about, which is why he's been trying to increase the salience of illegal migration. And I think anything that happens to him from this point on, he would consider to be a bonus point, if you like. You know, he's got the referendum, he's got Brexit, essentially, even if it's not the type of Brexit that, that he wanted to see. You know, I think he's personally aware that, that his legacy as such has been, been established. You know, and in that sense, he, you know, I, I don't think, personally, I don't think he'll be a, a major actor on the, on the political landscape now in the way that he was previously. But if I can just briefly pick up on something that Paul has just said, I think the risk for the European Union, and it's sort of no, you know, no surprises, I'm a little bit more sceptical perhaps than, than, than some on this, but the risk for the European Union here is that this crisis exacerbates the divergence between, to crudely put it, north and south. And I think looking at the polling in Italy for the last month or two, and I agree that polling in the context of an immediate crisis should be taken with a pinch of salt, but my current gut instinct is Italy will not only come out of this crisis a poorer country but will also come out of this crisis as a more Eurosceptic country because um, you know those perceptions of solidarity I think are very real and I think among ordinary Italians there's a clear sense that they no longer even have the ability to invest in their economy uh, in a way that might give them some reason to be optimistic about the future. And I think e what's been remarkable to me, especially on social media over the last month, has been otherwise very pro-European commentators even now beginning to say that either this is going to move into a full-blown fiscal union and we're going to actually see the economic integration alongside the political, or there's going to have to inevitably be some further type of contraction in the years ahead. Because to be honest, I mean, morally and ethically, what is going to happen to countries like Italy over the next decade, two decades, with the amount of debt is just going to be unsustainable, in my view. Right. OK. Uh, Catherine, any response to, to that, knowing Italy as you do? Well, I, I think that the I think the reactions, um, particularly at the very beginning of the, the European uh, recovery mechanisms in Italy from actually, you know, very pro-European uh, commentators, very pro-European politicians, um, you know, were, were, quite, were quite striking. Um, you know, some of them going as far as saying, well, you know, we're just going to have to go at, go at it alone, right? You know, now you make of that what you will, but the fact is that, you know, th that, is, that is quite definitive um, language. Um, I think to some extent, you know, there was an element, this is Italy, there was an element of the performance piece in, in, in that, in the sense, no, in, in the sense that, you know, it was very important to send this message and for Conte to allow for this message to emerge in order for the EU to, you know, to take stock and realize that it needed to take significant steps. And I, and I think that to some extent that's been you know, uh, in the short term effective. But I would just add one thing, which is not just um, um, on Italy, um, you know, and on Italy, I would say that, you know, um, I think it will take a lot to pull Italy out, but I think that it's quite clear that the wounds of the previous financial crisis and, and the banking crisis, Eurozone crisis were not healed. And this was salt to those wounds. And that that's quite clear. 
But, but on top of that, I think that we're not just going to see a north-south divide in Europe, which is a threatening, uh, you know, which is a source of tension, right? You know, whether it's an existential threat is a slightly different discussion, but, but actually it is a source of tension at a time where institutions may not be able to manage it so well. But there's also going to be an east-west divide in terms of how the money from the recovery uh, funds get spent, right? You know, in terms of whether it goes into traditional industries or whether it gets spent, in fact, in a kind of more climate friendly transition and so on and so forth. That's an awful lot of tensions, you know, at the heart of, of one political alliance. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Catherine. So um, I'm going to uh, leave all of you with um, just one question. You have to answer it, even though it's completely unfair. Uh, I suggested at the beginning there's three responses to this, which was uh, populists generally will benefit. Uh, number two, populists generally will actually suffer as a result of the pandemic. Or option three, it's too complicated to be able to tell. Uh, and I'm going to go around and ask each of you in turn. So starting with Paul, one, two or three, populists up, populists down, or it's too complicated? It's too complicated and it's too early to tell. Okay, Catherine. Uh, I, I actually, unfortunately, think populists up in the medium term. <laughs> okay, and uh, Matt, finally, you. I, I agree with Paul. I, <laughs> too early, too early to say, yeah. Okay, I'd just like to thank you very, very much for giving up your time, uh, all three of you. I'd like to thank all of you who've uh, tuned in, as it were, if that's the right expression. Uh, if you have tuned in late uh, or you want to pass on, uh, the fact that this is a Zoom event that uh, would be worth uh, looking at again. We will put it out on YouTube. We'll also put out an audio version on uh, SoundCloud. Uh, UK and Changing Europe produces a podcast which comes out uh, either every week or every couple of weeks. You can always listen to those as well. We're going to be putting on more of these Isolation Insight events. So if you've enjoyed this one, please do come back for more. And please do tell uh, your friends and family, uh, whether you can see them in the flesh uh, after Wednesday or not. Thank you very much, and uh, we will end it there. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.